Well, good afternoon and welcome to Hudson Institute. I'm Ken Weinstein, President and CEO of Hudson Institute. I'd like to welcome everyone for an important uh, discussion today, the Chinese economic and trade challenge to the West, German and US perspectives. This is a, a critically important issue and I'm delighted that uh, the foul weather notwithstanding and the news of a uh, new government in uh, Berlin as well, notwithstanding that we still have a, a decent crowd here for uh, today's event. Uh, as we all know, as part of its development model and its incredible strategic economic transformation, China has sought to become self-sufficient and globally competitive in advanced technologies and it has invested heavily in industries ranging from electric vehicles and robotics to aerospace. But to achieve these goals, China has employed questionable trade policies, including forced technology transfers, massive state subsidies, and targeted acquisitions of foreign technology companies. These goals and policy practices present a major challenge to Western manufacturing and high tech sectors. Candidate and now President Donald Trump and his economic advisors have spoken out about these practices, uh, including our own colleague, uh, Dr. Michael Pillsbury, who's uh, noted work on, uh, on uh, Chinese economic uh, strategy. The 100-year marathon has received significant attention. Uh, and questions are now being raised, not just here in Washington, but uh, around the corporate world here in the United States, uh, who are beginning to rethink some of their engagements in China, but also in Europe and in Berlin in particular. And I, I have to say, in my interactions with German officials over the last six or eight months, this has invariably become a topic, uh, uh, how to deal with uh, uh, China and its, uh, its trade practices. So given this growing concern, I'm delighted that uh, Hudson Institute senior fellow Thomas Duesenberg has an important new Hudson Institute study, Chinese Economic and Trade Challenges to the West, Prospects and Consequences from a U.S.-German Perspective. Uh, this report outlines strategies for Germany, the U.S., and, and, other, and our allies to promote cooperation to counter the unique challenge of Chinese mercantilism. We at Hudson Institute are deeply appreciative of our good friends at the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, uh, for funding the research and the completion of this report. Uh, the U.S. director, the Washington director for the uh, Adenauer Stiftung, Nico Lange, just uh, left Washington to return to Germany, where he's becoming a lieutenant governor in Saarland. But uh, we're delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Stefan Friedrich uh, from the uh, New York uh, office, the director of the New York office, and other colleagues here in Washington for today's event. We have a rather distinguished panel to discuss this paper and the unique challenge posed by China, which includes Dr. Jürgen Rutgers, uh, the chairman of the European Commission's high-level strategy group for industrial technologies, and Dr. Kent Hughes, the former associate deputy secretary of commerce for international trade. But to begin the event, I have the unique uh, pleasure and privilege of uh, introducing my friend and mentor, uh, Tom Dusterberg, who uh, preceded me as the director of Hudson Institute's Washington office. Tom served with uh, great distinction as Assistant Secretary of Commerce for International Economic Policy under President George H.W. Bush. He served as Chief of Staff uh, to Senator Dan Quayle and to uh, Representative Chris Cox in the uh, House of Representatives, uh, two members of Congress who in particular have concerns about uh, how China's rise is, was and is being accomplished from 1999 to 2011, he was president and CEO of the Manufacturers Alliance for Productivity and Innovation, MAPI, MAPI an economic research and executive education organization based in uh, Virginia. And uh, Tom has written with uh, great insight on U.S. manufacturing and trade. He's the author of over 150 articles uh, in journals and major newspapers and uh, someone whose uh, work and research is uh, widely listened to here in Washington. So without any further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce Tom, who will present uh, his paper. Thanks, Ken. And thanks to all of you for uh, turning out on a cold, rainy day here in uh, winter, wintertime Washington. Also want to extend my thanks to the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung for 
uh, support on this project and inspiration for this project. I have a few slides here. Um, but let me start by um, noting that um, something that Jack Ma, this is a sort of a Chinese proverb type way of starting this, something that Jack Ma said almost 15 years ago um, when Alibaba was first starting to challenge eBay for control of Chinese, China's online shopping market, Ma predicted that in the home market, Chinese startups like his would inevitably triumph over quote unquote barbarian invaders no matter how deep the foreign firm's pockets. eBay, Ma famously proclaimed, may be a shark in the ocean, but Alibaba was a crocodile in the Yangtze River. He said, if we fight in the ocean, we lose. But if we fight in the river, we win. Um, this is a metaphor for how China feels that it can dominate its home market. Um, and we're going to talk a lot about the uh, Chinese industrial policy that is driving that. But uh, we also ought to note the One Belt, One Road project is a, in a way an extension of the Yangtze River to the west and an attempt to uh, establish Chinese businesses and political influence further and further along the Old Silk Road. My theme today is what China is doing is qualitatively and quantitatively different from the trade and economic disputes that we've had in the past, and it deserves more scrutiny and attention than it has up to this date, especially from uh, those who have driven the uh, Bretton Woods system um, and the World Trade Organization system. So let me start uh, by talking just for a minute about um, the structure of the German economy. Um, uh, the German economy is dominated by uh, its outstanding manufacturing sector, outstanding workers, outstanding training, uh, it's export-oriented economy. 23% of output uh, in, in Germany is for manufacturing, about double the percentage uh, in the United States. But it has an aging population, the third oldest in the world. It's starting to outsource production to uh, places like the Visegrad nations. Uh, women are underemployed in, in the workforce. Uh, Germany has struggled to top 2% growth Incomes there are high, but lag the United States and other countries. Notably, household consumption in uh, Germany is, ver is very low, as figure one shows. Uh, uh, German um, uh, total household consumption is around 53 to 55% of GDP, relatively low growth. Um, it's grown relatively slowly over time. Um, and this shows a few uh, comparisons with a few other European nations over the last 20 years or so. Uh, it lags other European countries, which may have some political as well as economic implications within Germany. Um, by contrast, its external sector is booming. Uh, about a third of production is actually exported from Germany. Uh, wage growth has been restrained for uh, the last couple of decades. Uh, the labor share of national income uh, has dropped from about 65% to 60% in recent decades. Capital investment lags high flyers like uh, Korea and China. I have a, a few figures on, uh, showing that. Figure three here uh, compares uh, capital investment as a percent of GDP. Uh, the bottom lines are U.S., Japan, the top line is China, I didn't put Korea in there, um, but um, uh, capital investment has not been growing that much in Germany. Um, one of the results of this is that uh, some of the infrastructure in Germany is starting to fall in terms of equality. This is, happens to be roads, if you look at the railroad network, if you look at airports, especially again in comparison with the East Asian uh, growth giants, uh, it's lagging. Um, low consumption, restrained investment, and high savings combined for outside trade surplus, 
which is unsustainable in the long run. Uh, this is a figure shows that Germany is the, the red line at the top. Uh, consistently in the last three or four years, uh, about 8% of GDP uh, is uh, a, a trade surplus. And the number may even be a little bit higher than that if some German economists are right about how you measure um, the, the trade surplus. Um, I have in, in our report, if you want to pick up a copy, uh, some numbers about the leading industrial exports and in, imports in, um, in Germany, um, the traditional areas, autos, heavy machineries, electronic machinery, Germany is a, is a real powerhouse, um, but China is starting to catch up and China is starting to be a huge market for German exports. Uh, Germany lags behind China and the United States in venture capital spending and high technology startups. Um, autos and other industrial exports are increasingly leveraged to China as well. Car German car sales in China approach 5 million vehicles, 75 or 80% of them produced in China. But the German trade balance with China is deteriorating. The uh, lower line, the red line there, shows the trade balance with China at the same time as their trade surplus with the United States is growing. The overall German balance of trade is causing friction with traditional allies in, the, in Europe and the United States. Uh, later, I, I'm going to argue that rebalancing will help ad address China's, the Chinese threat and possibly help reduce these frictions through rebalancing of macroeconomic policy. And let me turn for a few minutes to uh, the Chinese industrial policy uh, best um, encapsulated in their Made in China 2025 program. This program is designed to move China up the technology ladder in 10 industries of the future. Tactically, it strives to dominate the huge internal market as a la Jack Ma and foreign markets as well as time goes on. Um, the next figure gives a few of the targets for uh, dominance of the internal market by 2025. You can see at the top, uh, uh, new energy vehicles, i.e. electric cars. Um, this is, of course, a direct threat to uh, the excellent German car industry. Um, its tools for achieving these goals, uh, in addition to e exploiting the economic, economics of scale via the huge internal market, are subsidies, protect protecting domestic markets, forced technology transfer, strengthening state-owned enterprises, buying or stealthily acquiring technology wherever they can find it, and setting Chinese-specific product standards. State and local subsidies and targeted industrial policy tend to encourage oversupply, uh, as we have seen in the steel industry. New plans for the semiconductor, robotics, and electric vehicle battery plants point to a large oversupply and potential dumping abroad. If their plans for building semiconductor plants uh, ever come to fruition, which they won't, uh, China would have a, something like six times the capacity that they need internally for consuming the, the product. China protects the auto sector with a 25% import tariff, requiring joint ventures with foreign firms producing in China and requiring tech transfer to the joint venture partners. China seeks to control 80% of the electric vehicle market by 2025, Again, uh, uh, under the score, it's a, it's a direct threat to German signature industry. Ger uh, China has been on a buying spree in Germany and the rest of Europe and in the United States in the last few years. Huge increases in the number of Chinese acquisitions of German technology firms, oftentimes directed by um, um, the China, Made in China 2025 program uh, and by its, uh, those who are trying to achieve that uh, uh, from Beijing. Uh, a signature um, acquisition was the German robotics maker, KUKA, uh, which has happened a couple of years ago. Um, the German research firm, uh, the Mercator Institute for China Studies, estimates that China won't make most of its 2025 targets 
but it is gaining considerable ground on its OECD rivals in 3D printing, robotics, industrial process software, electronic payments. It is the leader by far in electronic payments, by the way. Uh, the U.S.-China Economic and Security uh, Commission suggests that China is ahead in artificial intelligence and quantum computing. Again, I, the, the One Belt, One Road program is a force multiplier by extending Chinese own infrastructure and attendant political influence further and further to its west. So I, I would insist that it's not just Germany that is um, uh, endangered by the, um, uh, the Chinese aggressiveness, but it's other industrialized countries, including most prominently the United States, but Japan uh, and other European countries as well. China already has a $375 billion trade surplus with the U.S. alone and a growing trade surplus with Germany. So now I want to turn to um, a few uh, suggestions on how, uh, how we meet the challenge, and I, I underscore the term we because my point is that um, this is a bilateral confrontation between the United States and China is probably not going to uh, be as, as effective as if uh, uh, we could do with um, a, a more coordinated effort or parallel effort at least with some of our leading um, and traditional allies. And I underscore Germany as a leader of the European Union, um, Japan. Um, so the um, first basket of actions um, I would put in terms of trade action. U.S. national security strategy just announced, by the way, puts coordinated action on China as a very high priority. So amongst the trade actions, I would say first, enforcement actions need to be redoubled. Uh, Anti-dumping, countervailing duty cases, many of them are already filed. Uh, need to compel China to honestly report subsidies, which it's required to do under the um, rules of uh, uh, joining the World Trade Organizations. It's never done that, especially at the local and the regional level. Second, we need to rethink WTO treatment for state-owned enterprises. For instance, in terms of subsidies, involvement of the Communist Party officials on the boards of directors of companies, uh, which is now trying to extend to joint, joint ventures as well. Uh, government procurement restrictions, local content requirements, treatment of acquisitions of foreign firms, all need to be rethought, again, in the context of the World Trade Organization treatment of state-owned enterprises. Third, we need to focus at government and private sector levels on Chinese use or exploitation of standards to protect and extend product dominance by Chinese firms. Um, fourth, we need to carefully consider rules for screening foreign direct investment. We do not always know the source of funds or the direction of some Chinese firms trying to acquire Western technology firms, as in robotics or semiconductors or uh, industries that more uh, directly affect national security. Um, the United States has a more or less robust uh, uh, system to screen foreign investment. It's under consideration in the Congress to expand its scope and uh, there's increasingly uh, discussion in Europe about um, uh, investment screening uh, at the community level. Fifth, we need to redouble efforts to protect intellectual property from being undermined or forced to be transferred or outright stolen, such as apparently done for the windmill operating system software uh, that a Chinese company acquired. The second basket that I would uh, underscore is German macroeconomic policy. I outlined some of the macroeconomic reforms suggested mostly by the European Commission, Commission and European think tanks that are intended to help reduce Germany's dependence on external markets, strengthen internal demand, and bolster competitiveness through investment. Such reforms would have both economic and political benefits. Uh, among the, the, the suggestions are strengthening the services sector by lightening regulation and helping get the banking sector back on solid footing and by including a more robust element of services-related research in the Industry 4.0 program. 
Second, reducing government surpluses uh, by increasing investment in research and development, education, and infrastructure development. Uh, third, reduce labor wages, if reduce labor wages, increase labor wages, helping to, <laughs> helping to bolster internal demand, encourage greater full-time work for women through a variety of mechanisms suggested by the, the commission. Uh, fourth, consider tax changes to stimulate more corporate investment. And finally, the, I would conclude by saying the, the combination of more investment and more domestic consumption would both reduce the political problem of an 8% trade surplus and stimulate rebalancing of the uh, internal economy, both in services and high technology sectors, which are a drag on German growth and competitiveness and increasingly needed to uh, uh, meet the Chinese uh, challenge. So let me stop there and um, invite Dr. Rutgers to the, to the podium for his comments. Mr. Weinstein, Mr. Düsterberg, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me also as a member of the board of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, who is uh, the best think tank we have in Germany and on the ranking, on a worldwide ranking, is one of the first tenth um, think tanks. Uh, and therefore, we are proud to be here also to present you this uh, study here at the Hudson Institute. Mr. Dixberg has published a paper in uh, The Globalist, uh, and he begins, uh, it was in December 22, uh, he begins with a sentence with very interest. He's yeah, right. US and European cooperation on economic issues is at a low that's uh, not a good message for Christmas. Uh, that is uh, describing of uh, the situation. We will show and we will discuss that, if it is right or if what we must do to find a new solution for the US-European economic relation. I will begin with some remarks to the European economy. And I will say that the European economy, and it, in particular the European industry, has, in my point of view, to face three epic challenges. The first is the transition from an industrial to a knowledge society. The second is the globalization, and the third is the digitization. Knowledge society Globalization and digitization are circular changes with the base on, but also reinforce each other. In the era of the knowledge society, the accumulated knowledge of mankind doubles every five to seven years. Each day, more than 20,000 scientific publications are published globally. The total number of scientists working currently on our globe equals the number of scientists accumulated over the last 2,000 years. Knowledge, ladies and gentlemen, has become a production factor. Without knowledge, no value chain in production or service would work. Knowledge is the most important resource of our time. And knowledge is also the new social question of the 21st century. Globalization means also for many, many people people in the world, that the economy may change, and globalization changed the world, and is also part of a changed world. 
In the last decades, millions of people could escape poverty due to globalization. And surely this has a, a great changing at the end. This has social consequences. More and more people, and you have the discussion here also in the United States, more and more people fear endangerment of their jobs. Relocation of research and production to foreign countries, drain of capital and drain of investment. Technological progress and innovation happen every day. In a period when every five minutes a new medical finding, every three minutes a new physical relation, and every minute a new chemical formula is discovered, no company can rest on its achievements. However, due to the dialectic of progress, new dependencies, insecurities and burdens arise as well. Therefore, it is right that we are reflecting on the chance of digitization, and we do it in the European industry. Five areas are gross can be identified. Robotics, clouds, big data analytics, social networks, and mobile. I will, be, I will make a, a remark to the social networks. You know that social networks are to a large extent controlled by the USA. However, never opportunities emerge as a surveillance of the internet by the state in the USA and in China calls for new norms and standards for data security and respect of privacy and connected to it for an alignment with the European legal system. It opens up new options to bring back production sites which have been relocated to foreign countries if it proves impossible to guarantee a broad free markets in accordance with the rule of law. China wants to overtake USA, I have read. International norms and multilateral structures shall no longer and mainly be influenced and determined by the West. They wanted that China had another, a better, the first role in this process. I also realize that the attempt to implement a market economy system with the dictatorship of the Communist Party is the challenge to liberal democracy and Western values. Moreover, the Europeans are concerned about China introducing under the name of social credit systems, a new method of leadership, which I have read, involving state of the art technologies that are so eerie, radical, that all who were able to take a closer look were struck dumb. We also recognize that the American president has signed an act that will allow the American Secret Service to collect and browse foreign communication for the coming six years. China, in its to total surveillance of its citizens, American, allows total tapping of a people throughout the world. The Europeans will not accept such a violation of human rights. Let me say some things to my job at Brussels. Last year, at the request of the European Commission, I assumed the chair of a high-level strategy group on industrial technologies. 
together with 12 experts from 11 states. We have the mandate to develop proposals for a new industry policy and a new research policy. This also includes developing ideas for a new ninth framework research, research program. The new program covering the years 2020 to 2025. It will be the largest research program with a volume of more than 18 billion euros. We will define new cats, you know this, key enabling technology. Namely, advanced manufacturing technologies, advanced materials and nanotechnologies, life science, micro-nano electronics and photonics, artificial intelligence, and security and connectivity. These cats will be multi-cats and crossover cats and will serve as the basis of missions. The first mission is an industry renewal to ensure the industrial leadership of Europe. The second target is to establish digitalization as a European job engine. For the first time in many years, digitalization represents a trend driven primarily by knowledge and know-how, not by cheap labor. No products, no serv new services, and new business models will emerge in all sectors of our economy and drive growth. The third mission is a European secure internet, we'll say the next generation of internet. Other headlines are refounding car industry, a circular carbon-free economy, a new networks for health, energy, and universities. And these are, our, the only, uh, these are only some keywords. Let me end, and let me say this. We wish to work together with all our partners and that means our, pastor, our partners in the West and on the topic, the United States. We also want to work together on the basis of Western values and with our friends in the Western Alliance. And I believe it's now time to decide that we want to, go, to do it together. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I thought we might be just sitting here informally at first, so I left my, my what passes for my thoughts right there. Well, I want to thank uh, Tom and the Hudson Institute for inviting me here today. And I want to, if I had a hat on, I would give a take it off uh, tip to Tom. Very, he's written a very useful, timely, and thought-provoking paper. I also want to have a tip of the hat to uh, Dr. Michael Pillsbury, who's here, who is the author, as you uh, know, of the 100-year marathon. I must say, as I went through Tom's paper and delved into some other reading, I wonder if he might not want to shorten the race. Uh, it it uh, will depend very much on what we, the US, what we, Germany, and we, the, the West, do in responding to what really is an enormous challenge. Tom, I thought, did a very nice job of looking at Germany's many strengths, including its industrial strengths, but also some of the domestic challenges that it faces. Germany has the habit that we used to have in the United States of uh, saving. We don't save enough here. A lot of people feel Germany saves too much. 
Uh, you remember the, the joke from the 1980s that if Americans got a tax cut of $500, they would spend the first 800 right away. So we, we can learn some things from Germany. On the other hand, I thought Tom was quite right that the size of the German current account surplus, which is troubling to us, but also, I think, troubling for elements of the European Union, particularly the southern tier, where still you have countries where youth unemployment is at the level of 30%. That is just not a good harbinger for the, pu for the uh, future. The, uh, they all, Tom also made some suggestions um, about what Germany might do, and I thought those will all sound. You heard him just refer to those recently. Germany, I think, faces an added set of challenge because it is such a key part, maybe the economic driver of the European Union. It's been a part of the EU from the early days. It has been such a, a force in favor of the whole European project. And I think that it needs, this is my personal view, needs to think a bit about how to respond to crises, that the mix of structural adjustment, which is clearly needed in many countries, but if you add it to a context of austerity, it makes structural adjustment all the more difficult. Structural adjustment usually means making it easier to lay off people. And if they can't find work because you're also adopting a project of, of a, a policy of austerity, that makes it, uh, it makes it doubly tough. And it is, uh, Germany has a lot of lessons that other countries might well follow. They looked at their social safety net, they looked at their macroeconomic policy, uh, they have a, a wonderful system to support their industry. I think everybody here now is saying, what can we learn from the German apprenticeship system? Uh, we already have some Fraunhofer institutes here who work closely with industry. And if it's a research project that really needs more fundamental research, they have links to a university and research institutes. So there's a lot of structural elements in Germany that are really important. But the thrust of Tom's paper, of course, is this enormous challenge of China. And uh, Ch China is nothing if not transparent about its aspirations and its strategies. If you read the Made in China 25 re 2025 report by the Marix Group, it is a stunning example of where China wants to be exactly where the US thinks it is going to be. The the other challenge that China poses is, is its size. Uh, to some extent, it replicates a, some of the challenges posed by Japan in the 1980s. You hear a lot of people in Washington who lived through that Japan rising, Japan going to take over the world, Japan is number one era. People say, well, I can just pull, pull, pull out my memos and speeches from that time and just cross out Japan and write in China. And there's certainly some truth to that. but. It was a very different situation in that Japan was really very much part of the Western Defense Alliance. It really was under the defense umbrella of the United States. China is in a very different place. China aspires to be its own uh, forceful national security and military power. China also poses a systemic challenge that is quite different and goes beyond the challenge posed by Japan. Uh, Tom mentioned the state-owned enterprises, and that's part of the Soviet heritage. And at times, those are a drag on growth. Some of them are not as efficient as they might be. On the other hand, they're an enormous coordinating body. Some of them are now being merged to become national champions. They provide an easy outlet for fiscal stimulus, should that be necessary in China in the era of the Great Recession had a larger fiscal stimulus relative to the size of its economy than the United States did. Second, China certainly has learned from Japan. They have taken elements, in my view, they've taken elements of the East Asian miracle. They, uh, of course, they have industry. They coordinate closely with industry. They set national priorities. They uh, foster their exports, including using a, a competitive currency strategy. That's what Japan did. They've acquired lots of intellectual property through a variety of means. That's what Japan did. They protect key industries. Tom mentioned the 25% tariff on the autos, auto imports. China wants to have its own industry. So they have picked up 
many of those uh, elements. And at the same time, they clearly have seen the importance and the ability to compete in international markets. And being able to compete in international markets is a real prize. I think of it as if you're doing well in your own country, it would be the equivalent of being a track star at the NCAA tournament. But if you're competing in the global arena, it's like going to the Olympics. And China has clearly increasingly developed products, and they have aspirations to have much more that not only meet the 70 or 80 percent target for their domestic consumption, but also want to be global dominance. One of the the uh, the striking things is if you read the uh, the latest speech by uh, Xi Jinping to the 19th Party Congress, I think you will be awestruck by the scope of its ambition. It is not a China standing up or a China becoming prosperous. It is a China on its way down what Dr. Pillsbury refers to as the 100-year marathon. They really want to be the number one country. Uh, Dr. Pillsbury introduced me to a book by Colonel Liu Ming-Fu called The China Dream. And the bottom line of that book is the age of hegemons is over. But China will be number one. And that's a wonderful aspiration. And it probably reminds us that neither the United States nor much of the West have that kind of energizing goal, that kind of energizing picture of the future. In that speech, Xi Jinping holds China out as a model for development. So you developing countries, you want to be prosperous, you might learn, well, he puts it a little more gently than that, but he's the hero. We're a model. We're glad for you to pursue it. He's called for a new type of major power relations. He's clearly working, and the investment patterns show it, to make China as much of an innovative power as it can be. And of course, he highlighted a number of the Chinese achievements. Tom mentioned the Belt and Road Initiative, which is just an extraordinarily ambitious, something like 10 times the size of the Marshall Plan, which had an enormous impact in the post-World War II era. The, uh, he also mentioned, I don't know if you mentioned your talk, but in your paper you talk about the, uh, the German initiative where there's a couple hundred million dollars put to, to modernize key sectors or move ahead in key sectors, but that's exceeded by 200 times what China is putting in to its own industrial policy. So Tom has some good suggestions about how to respond. I would really endorse almost all of them enforcing intellectual property rules and thinking about rules for the state-owned enterprises. You remember in the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations, there was a provision for, state, uh, for setting rules for state-owned enterprises. Many people questioned that whether it was really strong enough that if you're a minority partner, that may really influence. Or if you're a Chinese company where you now have party members sitting on your investment board, which may or may not happen, that's a, still evolving, then you say, well, wait a minute, we really have to think about Chinese companies in a different way. Uh, it would be, certainly you can imagine people saying, well, we have to have some rules with regard to some of the defense companies in the U.S., which are much closer to the U.S. government. Tom suggests that uh, standards can be used as a form of protectionism. And this, of course, makes one think of the Trans-Pacific Trade and Investment Partnership, which has languished for a bit. But I was heartened, and I, you have to discount everything I say, because in the world of your glass half full or half empty, I glass is never but half full, that uh, Secretary of Commerce Wilbur Ross mentioned, oh, yes, well, the TTIP negotiations are still alive. Well, that's interesting. I think there's compelling economic and geopolitical reasons to, to pursue that. Tom thinks that we really need to rethink the FDI rules, and uh, KUKA had that kind of impact in Germany, the ro top robotics company. And Germany, as I understand it, first went to Italy and France, and they went to the European Union, said you need to have something to screen foreign direct investment. The EU, EU, EU of course, takes longer to take action, but then Germany started to do a screening process again. In their case, I believe tied to uh, tied to uh, national security. And here, 
as Tom also mentioned, there are a number of proposals to strengthen CFIUS and broaden the ambit of it. One other thing in terms of U.S. response to keep your eye on is that there was recently an executive order suggesting a full look at the U.S. industrial base, defense industrial base, including the civilian parts of it that seem otherwise somewhat remote. It could be, we don't know what the report would be, but it could be a very first step toward the U.S. rethinking its reluctance to have some kind of national goals and national industrial strategy of its own. How would we pick what industries to look at? Just read China 2025. They have a list that's as compelling as you can find. Well, let me uh, conclude on a more optimistic note that we have to remember that while China is clearly a rival, they also are a potential cooperator on a number of global challenges. If you look at the National Academy of Engineering, they have a list of 14 goals. They've been developing global goals, flu pandemics, climate change, and so forth. They are working with the Royal Academy and with the Chinese Academy. So there are a host of areas where we are going to have to put our best minds together to have the kind of world that we want. Well, thank you very much. Thank uh, everyone on the panel, Dr. Gusterberg, Dr. Lutkus, uh, Dr. Hughes. It's been a uh, it was a fascinating uh, and wide-ranging uh, discussion, and uh, with frankly uh, different viewpoints on some critical issues. I thought I might start off by asking Tom if he would care to uh, respond to either of the uh, either of the comments or both of them. Um, yeah. Um, I want to thank uh, Kent for suggesting, uh, rightfully so, that there are an uh, enormous number of areas where we can and should be working with the Chinese on common problems, global problems like uh, the environment, um, terrorism, and the like. So I, I welcome that, uh, that addition. And I'm going to take up the um, challenge from Dr. Rutgers about privacy, um, he um, suggested that there was an equivalence between the Chinese and the American systems of uh, surveillance. Um, I admit this is an area where we ought to really devote some resources to thinking through what privacy policy ought to be. I would emphasize However, that uh, when you're talking about China, they are so advanced and so unscrupulous that we're dealing with a different type of actor than the United States. I just this morning saw a article in the Wall Street Journal about uh, new surveillance technology that the Chinese have. They are ahead in facial recognition. We all know that. And the reason they're ahead in technology of facial recognition is, number one, there are 1.3 billion people in China. Number two, everything about those people, whether it be gleaned by the government, by Alibaba, by the Chinese attempts to control all data that resides in China, is seen by the government as their property. So you have big data. And there are a lot of smart people in China. Um, and they have exploited that so that apparently, if this Wall Street Journal article is right, uh, they have their policemen, men and women, outfitted with a set of glasses that can look into a crowd and identify people in that crowd. And uh, China will continue to uh, develop that technology. Now, in the United States, um, I take the point about criticism of um, wiretapping. It's been going on all over the world, <clears throat> including in Germany, forever. It still goes on. 
um, our social media, which are ahead of the Europeans and the Chinese, are uh, doing things that probably most of us would wish that they weren't doing. But we need to think through with our uh, like-minded uh, allies in Europe based on our values and really think hard about what the, the, the rules ought to be. So I, I don't accept this equivalency between the United States and China, but I do think that we need to work hard to um, develop a system where we, we meet this, this, this challenge about protecting privacy to the best of our ability in this new digital age. Dr. Richter, do you, do you care to respond? And I should note you are the former minister, president of uh, uh, North Rhine-Westphalia, and a uh, former Bundestag member, and someone who is well tapped into both uh, public and elite opinion in, in Germany. Yeah. First, I want to say it was a wonderful answer. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Beck. Uh, in my point of view, I believe that we have now the situation for make some strategic decisions. Um, if you hear the TV or uh, also social media and also uh, you read newspapers about, about the United States, you have the impression that uh, all institutions are collapsed and uh, the polit uh, politics is uh, only in the Twitter and uh, other things. And my message is we must be 40 years and more, we do it together, and we must also do it together in the future. And that must mean we must discuss what is the, the strategic decision. If I debate, make a debate about the new world order, also here in the United States, with Secretary Kissing or things like this, we have also the situation we, we look on China, that's a crucial point, it's clear, it's a very uh, important point. We have not a look uh, so precise on Russia. We had a little debate with India, and surely we have uh, now debates here in the United States, and there is also Europe. And my message uh, today is, I believe, we have to uh, win the Cold War, uh, while we had the best uh, value. And while we had freedom, we had also the best and the efficient economy. And when this is right, it's no reason to look uh, to a new way. It's uh, the best way to do it together as West, as Western, with the Western values and with the democracies and with the free market system. And perhaps in uh, Europe, there is also a social market uh, free uh, system. OK, when this decision is clear, then we can also go together and find what does this mean for our communication. And you have here in the United States a great, great debate. And when I was uh, uh, looking on, on CNN today and yesterday, I don't understand this debate. Uh, what's happened there with uh, a paper from who comes from from uh, a committee on the Hill, and uh, there some some uh, politicians have write something, and okay, it's good. I write uh, uh, every day when I was in the Bundestag or the, or in the Bundesrat uh, a paper, and uh, normally uh, the press has also uh, read it and. Uh, they have not all published it, but uh, it, it is an open debate in a free country. And when, is, when it is right, the question is another one. The another one, the question is, do I want it to have a system like in China? The answer is no. The second uh, answer, do I want it that the Russians uh, have influence through an election in the free world? The answer is no. And then the question is, how can I do something that it is guaranteed that I have a democracy and that there's nobody on this world who has the right uh, to, to uh, take my rights with this uh, hacker uh, 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 works uh, in, in our system? Also, the next uh, scene, I, be, I believe that uh, we see it in the same time. And then, then 
I believe that it becomes uh, to be very interesting. How well we can be in this situation in the beginning New World Order, make an economic policy that also the poor people and not also, also the, the workers uh, on, in the Rost Belt or in the rural area must not fear that their job, that they lose their job, and that, they, you know, that they know that also in a digital world they have a chance for a job, for earning the money for their families and also for pay taxes. Perhaps in another party, uh, say no taxes is better than uh, to pay taxes, but um, I have a pension from, from the state and therefore I am interested uh, that there is some money uh, uh, for this. But if we do this, I believe we must also debate about the economic question. The economic question, normally, if you de uh, see the debate in Germany, you, are, uh, you have uh, also uh, take this word, it's very simple. There are the bad who are for uh, austerity, and there are the good, they are for more debt. But they have learned in the last uh, decade, uh, when we have the crisis, uh, the state uh, debt crisis uh, in many, many uh, Western states, and also the euro crisis, currency crisis, and we have uh, many, many uh, companies who had great problems uh, uh, to earn money, to uh, have not uh, uh, the perspective to be insolvent and, and things like this. We must make reforms, and therefore it is necessary to do many things together. Reforms and uh, not so many debts that we can pay it when there is uh, something uh, who, who goes wrong. And I believe there's a wonderful idea, that's an idea of uh, the inclusive growth. I believe that it's not only the growth rate uh, we know. I believe it is very important that our productivity goes on. If our productivity productivity goes up, we have a great chance to be competitive on the world market. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and there are no studies. They have uh, make um, uh, also working with in, working with and in companies. And they say if we wanted to have a knowledge society and we have a productivity who goes up, then we have also the chance that the jobs stay at home. And that's my perspective for the next uh, decade. Uh, we must do it together, and that means we must have fair trade and things like this. And we discussed uh, um, uh, how we do uh, this. And the last little point, don't forget in the United States that responsible for trade in Europe is the Europe Commission and not some member state. I have to have experience on this point, and uh, if you need something to help you in Brussels, I will help you. And on that note, let me ask you. Let me. Let me. Let me. Let me let's ask about China's role in Europe, um, which uh, Tom talked a bit about in his paper, and uh, well, all three of you you addressed it. I think there's some concern uh, here in Washington that. Uh, that as part of this this China 2025 strategy, as part of the 100-year marathon, the 75-year marathon, 50-year marathon, uh, the, the, the next edition of, uh, of Mike's book, uh, that, that the Chinese have, have started to concentrate a, a, a geostrategic effort driven by economic policy in Europe, uh, an influence campaign to sort of uh, affects, if, if you will, some of the weaker sisters within the European Union to prevent the emergence of a uh, of, of of a strong and unified policy of the kind that uh, Tom uh, laid out. And I, I want to uh, let me first turn to to Kent to get your sense of uh, is is that a fair perspective? Uh, I think China certainly, as the United States as others, wants to focus on its soft power. You find Confucius Institutes in many parts of the United States and elsewhere around the world. In some cases, they want to give a 
best foot forward in terms of how to view China. Uh, China, of course, like a number of advanced countries, has a great deal of cyber capacity. Uh, I have not read about their interfering in elections, as Russia clearly has, including I mean, we've focused on a lot in the United States, but they were certainly attempting to interfere, perhaps even in the Brexit decision. So those are cyber commands has to be taken seriously. I think, too, that because, at least in the US case, which I know better, we do not have these set strategies. We tend to say, well, the private sector, the market, it's a magnificent mechanism. China has clearly embraced it in many ways, that that will take care of things. But no matter how big or influential the company, if you set them out to compete with another foreign company that's heavily backed by the, uh, by the government, you simply are not going to get the kind of results that you want. So I think, again, it goes back in part to what Tom called for, which is how do we think of WTO rules that respond to a very different system? How do we get those two different systems to working together so there really is what we used to refer to as a more reciprocal relationship? I have experience with uh, China investment uh, in Northern Westphalia and also in uh, Europe. Um, and first I will say, do you mention KUKA? Mm -hmm, I did. Tom um, did also. Yeah, yeah, sure. It's, good. it's a good example. Um, KUKA is a, a company who is uh, on the highest level we know in Germany or in the world, in the world, for robotics. And uh, the Chinese wanted uh, to buy this company, and they have buy this company. And uh, everyone here in the United States asks, is this not, not a tec technical, uh, techno technology who is uh, critical for our security, and why do you allow this? The answer is uh, very simple. We have no uh, law that we can do it. You must understand what is the feeling in Germany. The first point is that we, after the Second World War, wanted to have uh, um, build a new uh, economy, and our vision was a free economy. And therefore, our the father of our social market uh, economy, Ludwig Erhard, has says no forbidden something in uh, the sector of economy. It's not allowed. But it's in old days, I know this. But uh, if you ask the Germans, I don't know who is this, but altogether, what is your vision for the future? It is very simple. The Germans want to be a great Swiss, which means uh, very wealthy and nothing to do something with problems. <laughs> and that is a problem. And therefore, it's a little bit uh, complicated for the politicians to explain what is necessary to do. If you have a question in the newspapers, it is possible that KUKA is going to uh, uh, Chinese uh, ownership then you can be sure that all economic pages in the newspapers write, surely it must be free. We are for free trade. We uh, are against the laws and things like this. But the next day, they write, it is terrible that so many um, uh, German companies uh, are now in ownership from abroad. We had personally experience on this. We had in uh, 10 years ago, 12 years, 50 years, an idea, an economic idea, the name was the bazaar economy, which means that we uh, go with investments abroad in countries who uh, the labor costs are uh, very uh, down. And we do it at, in China. I have to make as prime minister a visit with 50 uh, owners of uh, middle-sized uh, uh, companies. Middle-sized in Germany is still 5,000 workers. 
that are great, great companies, and normally they make things for the old car, uh, 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 Mercedes, BMW, and uh, Audi, and Porsche, and things like this. And the idea was we go with our countries in China. The cost for work is uh, very, very low in our point of view. One dollar uh, uh, an hour, it's, it's expensive. Yeah. And uh, in Germany, 47, uh, 47, 48, 49 uh, dollar uh, each hour. And then we take what they have made in China and we do it in the Mercedes or in BMW. Bazaar. We go there, produce there, the costs are low, and then we. It, nevertheless, uh, uh, you can do it. It has changed. You must see it. I was with uh, the 50 owners in their, in their uh, companies. They all produced only for the Chinese market. And if I discussed it with the prime minister in Peking, he said, Ooh, there are many, many German uh, companies who produced for the Chinese market. What does this mean? When they come and they invest in Nordrhein Westphalia, I ask them Huawei, uh, the great uh, uh, IT uh, um, company who gives mix uh, from mobiles uh, to uh, little components, uh, all what you want. Uh, they wanted uh, to come to to uh, Düsseldorf with the research center, and they come, 300 Chinese engineers on this place. And ask, why do you come to Europe? Why do you come to Europe? We wanted to, to come, uh, the answer was, we wanted to, to go to this market. Second question, why do you come to Germany? Uh, to Nordrhein Westphalia, I will begin. He said, oh, that's mitten in the heart of, uh, of Germany. The next uh, question, why do you come from Germany? We wanted to have the label made in Germany. And that was the decision making we do. Mm -hmm. not, they have no problem with something like this. They pay their taxes, uh, they know what's, uh, what, she, what is allowed and what she, uh, is forbidden and things like this. But the right question is, what is the strategic point? And I can also give an experience. There is a train on the one road, one belt. This train goes from Peking to Duisburg. Duisburg is at the Rhine, it's a Binnen Harbor, and it's the greatest uh, harbor, inn harbor of the world. And all what you, you send from the United States to Rotterdam, the next step is Duisburg and it goes <laughs> to Europe. Each week, there comes a train, th three, three trains, um, with uh, components from, from China. It's not uh, very valuable things, it's many, many plastic things for toys and uh, clothing and things like this. But in addition, this three trains is more containers, and that is more, uh, they transport more containers it's the greatest ships who go th uh, through the Suez Canal. And then you have the answer, that it's not expensive to, to, to go with the Chinese goods to our market. And that's the reason we, we, if they wanted to make trade, I believe that's not a problem. If they wanted to have an influence system, like they do in uh, Africa, then it is a problem. And that's what we must discuss. And we must discuss, and now that's a strategic point, how many we wanted to see, and what is our answer to invest. And I will give you one idea from my commission in, in, in Brussels. It's an old, an old idea. We have the, in the, the one belt, one road in Germany is Seidenstraße, Silk, uh, Silk Street. It's in the old trade uh, streets uh, in the uh, Mayan age. Uh, in the 19th century, the German emperor Guillaume, William, uh, II, William. William II, uh, has uh, made a train uh, to Baghdad. My question is, are we, are we impossible to build a train from 
Rabat, that's Morocco, to Algeria, to Tunis. And what is the, what, what's happened then if it is there? We say, okay, if you want in North Africa, have new jobs. You have a train, you can transport what you want, and you can found new companies there. If you are in Morocco, we have problems with uh, migrants uh, now in these days. If you are a young man in Morocco and you have no job, you must stay in your family. You have not the chance to marriage. You have not the chance, what does it mean, to become, uh, to, 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 to get honor, personal honor. And that's the reason they come to Europe. And I can also say what the organi who organizes, you know, that there are criminal uh, who goes with ships and it's very, very dangerous and things like this. The problem is something other. They all have smartphones and they come from the United States or China. And on the smartphones, the young people can see how we live. And they live in countries and have no chance. And then the family says, OK, we take our money. And normally, it's the grandmother who decides this. And she says, my, my grandson, uh, the second one, is very uh, intelligent. And now he goes. And then he comes, and he wants to work with you. And that's our problem. And all of them in the wave had smartphones with apps. And it was organized, I believe, also from NGOs and things like this. You know, there's a, uh, a little town. There is a policeman who is not very friendly. Go around. And the most important information from that, for that was where is the possibility to buy electricity for my smartphone? And then they come to our, to our borders. And I explain this, that you know that it's not, we are not uh, uh, crazy, that we say we want it, uh, that uh, our borders are uh, open and uh, everyone can come. We must organize the situation around the middle, uh, see. Lebanon has 1,500,000 refugees. A little, a little, little country. Uh, Jordania, stop it, three million. And you can see we must have jobs, and we must have jobs to a price that they can round in Africa and also in Europe. You have jobs, and then I believe we have the political problems are solved. Absolutely. Let me let me let me open it up. We have a very uh, distinguished audience here, and I, I want to acknowledge the presence of uh, the DCM of the Federal Republic of Germany, Boris Riga, back there, a good friend of Hudson Institute. Uh, thank you for being here, Boris. Uh, let me open it up to uh, questions. Let's try to keep the questions uh, brief, and the answer is also relatively brief given the the, the time requirements. Yes, thank you. And please identify yourself, and, and let's wait for the microphone. Uh, my name is uh, Pat Malloy. I, I was on the China Commission for a number of years. Um, I was also in the Clinton administration, Assistant Secretary for Trade. Um, what I, I was, when I was on the Senate Banking Committee, I saw the movement from stakeholder to shareholder capitalism, where the corporations used to think they had a responsibility to their workers, their communities, their nation. Now, if you ask CEOs what their responsibility is, it's to make their shareholders wealthy. And, and then their own compensation has been tied to their ability to make shareholders wealthy. If China can offer a company a chance to make more for its shareholders by transferring jobs, technology, and other things to China, and, we, and, and, and this happens. And then I remember Ken Lieberthal, who was on the NSC staff under President Clinton, pushing for bringing China into the, WTO, into the WTO, he wrote a book and he said, when Congress considers what the Chinese called trade distorting measures, the Chinese government gets the American companies to lobby against that legislation. Well, I'm wondering, are we, don't we have to deal with our corporate governance problem as part of dealing with a Chinese strategy, particularly in these Chinese companies, they have party people on these companies, so they're working for the Chinese people and government. Our companies are working for their shareholders. They don't, 
they don't feel they have any responsibility toward the country. Is that a problem that we should have to address in dealing with a Chinese strategy? Sure. Let me turn to Kent. Do you want to handle that? Well, I think, Pat, you've got a, some very good points. That it's part of how the world has changed. And it's not only the shareholder uh, interest. And, of course, it, shareholders have a lot of different interests. If you're poor, like me, then you're sort of thinking, well, can I save something for my grandkids? Or if you're uh, a trader, you want something almost overnight. But I think the, the other reality is that more and more of the top companies, whether they're German or Dutch or Japanese or American, are increasingly global in their outlook. So that their interest, where they you know, use the old phrase, the, uh, the world is their oyster, and they'll look for pearls wherever they can. So that they don't have the same relationship with national governments that they did. They try to be good national citizens wherever they are, but it is a, it's part of the many changes that we have to digest in developing a national and global strategy. Can I just want to briefly comment? Um, I think China is helping us solve that problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, because, um, I mean, for many years, I, I was associated with a, um, a trade association, a research trade association of manufacturers. And I remember very distinctly about the time uh, Clinton administration, f f uh, second Bush administration, there was a herd instinct in corporate boardrooms. You have to go to China. You got to get the China price. China now has done a slow but steady um, change to their receptivity towards foreign investment. And with the Made in China 2025 program, they slowly are squeezing uh, foreign companies so that it's uh, not as uh, profitable, not as easy to operate in China as it once was. I mean, they're always going to take foreign investments. But my sense is that the, the corporate boardrooms now understand that there are things other than just pure um, costs of production uh, that are impeding them from doing well in China. And I would also say that, at least in the manufacturing sector, traditional manufacturing sector, um, there's, uh, it's not completely right to say that they have no loyalty to the areas that they uh, operate in, to their workers, to their communities. They still think about trying to be good corporate citizens. I mean, the pressures from Wall Street are all in the other direction, but I think it's, I think it's changing, so. Um, the former. Yes. After the crisis, it come back. Here to Mike Pillsbury. Thank you. I have a very specific question for uh, Dr. Jurgen Rutgers. <clears throat> I, heard, I heard you say two things. I was hoping you could expand. One was the need for a strategic decision. Should the US and Europe uh, cooperate jointly on the problems of Chinese trade and economic policy? Uh, and my question about that is, how would that be done? And my second question is related to it. You mentioned, uh, I was very happy to hear you mention 18 billion euros is the budget of your high-level uh, strategy group. Could, could some of this 18 billion euros be spent on developing a new mechanism through which the United States government and European governments, and especially the EU, could coordinate, could cooperate? And the reason I ask both these questions, I'm writing a report myself right now on the tragedy of European, American, a China strategy is not only not coordinated, but we have two very separate paths. And as an American, I blame the European side for doing this. Uh, there's 20 years of history now where the EU, and now through the new executive uh, action service, but the EU has had summits with China and also with Asia, deliberately excluding American observers, we have to sort of beg to find out what happened. So in 20 years of these two separate policies, and we, of course, Americans also deal with China separately. We very seldom tell Europe uh, what we're doing. 
I think the strategic decision should be yes, we should cooperate. I think some of your 18 billion euros should be used to find a mechanism to do this. But both of us have to kind of apologize for pursuing separate tracks, don't you think? First, I wanted to say we uh, can now run uh, faster mm -hmm. than uh, uh, before. Uh, the answer to uh, it's possible to, to have money for, for uh, coordinate this and to have ideas, which means research on uh, innovation system and Western innovation system. That, what does this mean? The answer is yes. If there are two new uh, ideas I have also in uh, uh, our debate. I believe that we must also discuss about the future of Western democracy and uh, the governance in a Western uh, democracy in a market system. Um, what does this mean? It means we must also give money for cultural research, for social research, and things like this. It's new, something new. That's not only technology assessment. My first job in the Bundestag was a chair on a committee of technology assessment. We do it also. That is also, that's very important, but I wanted to debate, and I believe that's very important. Democracy lives from participation from the citizens. Participation means you must have transparency. You must discuss it in an open way. What are the problems? And that if you come to the United States, you know that it is a strong country. That's like here. We debate things like this. And then we have ideas. But it, you must have platforms. And we have a little problem in, uh, in uh, Germany and in Europe. We have not the system of think tanks, you know, here from, uh, from uh, the United States. Hanau Stiftung is uh, yeah, wonderful. And, you observe uh, that $18 billion and, dollars and, uh, and things that problems is, will all be solved. The answer is uh, yes, uh, uh, we can uh, do it. Answer is good? Yes. Okay. <laughs> that time is running brief. We got, there's two, let's, let's start with you and let's go over here and try to make both questions brief. We're actually out of time, but I want to get to these two questions and then we'll, we'll wrap up. And please identify yourself. In case. Uh, my name is Joel Coulter. I'm kind of involved in the supply chain security program for our government. So I would like to piggyback on Mike Pillsbury's comment that our approach to the world, and, and we've been on different tracks, and what China has done is leverage that to this global supply chain in a lot of areas. China has positioned itself in AI, robotics, somewhat you've helped them with, I know about. You've transferred advanced robotics to China that made our Navy and other people kind of concerned. So the question I have to you is, are you aware of the government-owned company-operated strategy that we're moving forward with in this government to secure our supply chain from mission-critical systems, energy, water, military? And is this a way we can find a way to cooperate with Europe on that? I have a way to... Uh to make it clear also to members of the government, I uh, make him uh, a little gift, uh, the book of uh, Daniel Ellsberg, Blackout. And when they have read this, there are uh, very uh, emphasis for finding a solution uh, on this. It's a problem, surely. It's necessary to do it, and we have the debate. And my point now is uh, we make, make, make it Closer, so close as it is possible. Another point, one of my colleagues here has mentioned Fraunhofer. Uh, and Fraunhofer is in the United States. And Max Planck, that's uh, his basic research, it is also in there. When I was uh, as uh, Minister for Future, that was the name for research technology, in, in the 90s in the uh, government of Helmut Kohl, I must work very close together with Fraunhofer and Max Planck and them. And we debate how can we help that our young researcher doesn't only go to the United States, to the National Health Institute, and then they come back. And is it not possible to make something together? OK, they say we wanted to go also abroad, but we, um, it's not allowed while we are financed from uh, tax money. 
And then I have uh, said to my colleague, uh, to, to, to my, my um, uh, collaborator in the, in the ministry, I wanted to decide that Fraunhofer can go to the United States also with German tax money. And that was a decision why you can go to Boston and you have two Fraunhofer institutes who are very happy to visit them. It's wonderful. And the second step was uh, Max Planck com, uh, comes, and it's all interest. Many, many of the researchers at the Max Planck Institute in Germany come now from uh, universities here in the United States, and that's what I want. And in Europe, we do it like so. We have changing our system, that's uh, bachelor and master, Bologna process, but, uh, um, you have it, uh, heard. And now we have a program, Erasmus, six mil million uh, students have till today going from their university to a broad university. That's a help from a little help from, from, from the states, from, from the European Union. Six million are going out to other universities. And things like this, that are the right, the, the right way to, to um, do something together, not today, also in the future. Final question here. Uh, Brett Fortnum from Inside US Trade. After Secretary Ross um, in Davos mentioned that there is a possibility that TTIP could someday be picked up again, Commissioner Malmstrom um, told reporters that the, the environment between the US and EU has changed um, and didn't really sound too optimistic about the, the, the chances of, uh, of TTIP. Um, specifically, Specifically, she mentioned the Section 232 report on the national implications of, of uh, steel imports that, that is definitely of EU concern. I'm wondering, um, given the fact that the Trump administration has routinely criticized um, the WTO, uh, the OECD's um, working group on steel, how can the US and EU cooperate in addressing some of the, the challenges that have been outlined today that, that China's emergence is, is creating, uh, what form, what type of work, and given the Trump administration's unilateral action so far, is that seen as a possibility with this administration, or will there have to be, as Bern Lange has mentioned before, will the EU have to wait for a new administration to, to work with the U.S.? But why don't we, why doesn't everybody take this as an opportunity to answer the question and add anything else they wish to wrap up with? And we can start, uh, you want to start with Kent and then? Well, of course, I can't speak for Malmstrom, but I think the economics and the geopolitics for reviving TTIP in some way is quite compelling. And particularly the work on trying to set global standards that are widely and universally accepted and not used to limit access to a particular market. I think, and behind all of this, and I like the questions about cooperation uh, with Europe, it makes sense. Cooperations with parts of Asia, it makes sense. This was, of course, one of the elements that could have led to a, perhaps a different kind of uh, trans-Pacific partnership. So I think that the, we have to think of two tracks at the same time. Number one, each country has its own kind of needs. Here, we need to rediscover the competitiveness strategy that is productivity-driven growth that's broadly shared. And second, we, we need to have a set of priorities here, a word that is still impolite to use in, in mixed company, industrial policy. We need kind of an industrial policy with American characteristic that recognizes the states and the private sector. And we have to think about global institutions. How do we adapt? not just the WTO, but the old Bretton Woods institution and a host of other institutions to this new world, new challenges, and so forth. Okay. Okay, I, I just comment. Um, my whole thrust of my argument was let's find some things that we can work on together. Um, I, I believe that there is... There are discussions going on around the sorts of questions we've discussed today uh, with the, the Chinese challenge. We are not going to move quickly to 
a TTIP. I think everybody knows that on both sides of the Atlantic. Not the least of the reasons is that public opinion in Europe is not ready for this. And they weren't last year when there was perhaps the greatest possibility of moving rapidly on uh, uh, TTIP. Uh, public opinion, Germany, France, just not there. So we have to rebuild trust. Um, and I think one of the ways to do that is to find areas like the Chinese challenge where we can work together and slowly rebuild that trust that will allow us to take a bigger step. Okay, we'll let that be the final word. I want to thank our panelists. I also uh, want to uh, thank uh, our good friends from the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung uh, for this effort at transatlantic cooperation, for which we are deeply grateful. I just want to remind everyone that the copies of uh, Tom Dusterberg's paper are out there. They're available on our website, hudson.org, and look forward to uh, uh, seeing everyone down here again before too long. I want to again thank the panelists for a very, uh, very interesting and very lively uh, conversation this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.